Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. Today we're going to talk about object pooling. This is a pretty common practice in all kinds of game development because creating new objects is very expensive. And actually, especially if you take a mobile game and just create even 10, 20 objects, there's a visible stutter that happens there. So the practice of object pooling is to pre-create as many objects as you'll likely need, and then just reuse those in the scene by enabling and disabling them. So a really common example of this is bullets that do not use a hit scan method. You typically will have potentially dozens or hundreds of bullets being fired every second, right? And the process of creating them is very expensive. And then actually whenever you destroy the object too, there's garbage that's created. And in Unity, of course, garbage is, or any game engine, garbage is awful because it will, again, cause a stutter whenever the garbage collector comes and tries to free up all of that memory. Object pooling solves like all of these problems. Almost. So how does it work? You generally either on awake or start will create as many objects as you think you'll likely need. So in the case of bullets, what I do is take the expected rate of fire. So if I'm going to fire 30 bullets a second, I do 30 times the duration that a bullet will live because eventually it should just kill itself. It's gone too far, maybe it's outside the scene bounds, something like that. And so let's say it's three seconds. So I'll take 30 times three, and I'll make 90 total bullets. Then I know for sure I will not be generating any additional bullets throughout the gameplay. The other important thing is instead of destroying the, uh, instead of destroying the game objects, you disable them and you enable them. So in, in your on enable and on disable, you need to do some cleanup because you're, when you first spawn the bullets, you'll maybe do some kind of setup. That setup should be the exact same as what you do on enable because you need to make sure the state is completely reset whenever you're recycling the objects. Otherwise you get weird bugs like maybe they have, they kept some velocity from the last time or they think that they're in the wrong position and continue on from wherever they died, stuff like that. So you need to make sure you fully reset the state whenever you enable or whenever you disable any objects you're using in a pool. That's very critical and something that a lot of times in tutorials they don't cover. So we will be covering that today. So in this video, what we'll do is we'll create some simulated shooting mechanic where we will recycle bullets. This is an extremely common case, but not the only case. You can pool just about anything. I pool explosions, I pool enemies, I pool uh, blood splatter effects, and anything where it's going to be the same thing that happens over and over and over again. Those are things that you want to consider object pooling for. Any dynamic created objects during the scene, probably want to pool those. So we're, we're going to hop in and make some bullets pooled. How we're going to show object pooling here is we're going to create a player that will be a beautiful square and he will be shooting some bullets, which will be beautiful red squares out of his body. For the bullets, they'll need a rigid body 2D component. That's how we'll manage the movement of them. And we'll turn it into a prefab and turn off gravity. We'll also quickly create some scripts that we'll need bullet, object pool, and poolable object. We'll need a couple more than this, but these will be the first three that we'll mess with. Let's start with the object pool since that's the biggest piece of this. That's the whole point of this video. So we don't actually need any of the stuff Unity gives us. This will be a standard, just C-sharp class. We don't need mono behavior, anything like that. 
We'll create two class member variables, the prefab, that will be a poolable object, and a list of poolable objects, which will be the available objects in the pool. We'll create a private constructor because we don't want anybody to instantiate object pools anyway, other than using a static method we'll create right after the constructor. So the constructor will just take the prefab and the size of the pool, which will be the default size of the available objects. Then let's create the way to create an object pool. Make a public static object pool, create instance. So this function will return an object pool. It'll take in, again, the same two arguments we needed for the constructor, the prefab and the size of the pool. We will create an object pool. We'll create an object for the object pool and we'll put all of the objects we're going to pool as a child of that, as, of that object. If we don't do this, our scene kind of gets really out of hand with just hundreds or thousands of objects all on the root level. You don't have to do it this way. If you don't want to do it, you can skip this game object creation. I find it's a lot easier to manage and look through the editor while you're running the game. So that's why I do it this way. Then we'll do pool.createObjects. So whenever we create the pool, we'll also create all of the objects for the pool and then we'll return the pool. So whenever we create objects, let's make that function private void create objects. It'll take the parent that we want to put all of the objects under and again the size so we know how many to create. So we'll just loop from i equals zero to i less than size, incrementing by one. We'll instantiate a new poolable object, which would be of the prefab type. Vector three, zero, and quaternion identity are just the default transform for those. And by passing parent.transform, we're saying create this object as a child of that parent. Since we're creating a poolable object, we'll put the parent as this. We'll get to that in a second whenever we actually go into the poolable object, but we'll need a way to add an object back into the pool after it's been disabled. So that's why we want a reference to the parent there. The last thing is we'll disable that object. We don't want all of these objects to be active by default. Only whenever we ask for a new object do we want to enable it. You'll notice that we're not adding the poolable object to the list of available objects. That automatically happens when we disable it, or it will once we get into poolable objects. So don't worry about that yet, we'll get there. Then we will create a way to return the object to the pool. We'll make a public void return object to pool, make it take a poolable object, and just add that back into the list. The last thing that this pool needs to be able to do is to get an object. So we'll create a new function called get object that will return a poolable object. There's two cases to the get object function. One, where you have available objects, and that one's easy. You just get the first one, remove the first one from the available objects list, set it to active, and return that first instance. The second case is more tricky and will depend on how you want to write your game. If there are no objects available in the pool, you can return null saying, hey, there's no objects, I can't give you one. You need to, and whoever the caller is needs to handle that. The downside there is that you always have to manage a null return and your game could explode if you don't. The benefit there is you will not ever generate new objects at runtime, meaning there will be no new garbage or some visible stutter as a result of object creation. The second option is you expand the size of the pool. So you need to create some new objects, set them to disabled and return one of them. The plus side there is you will always get a poolable object back but the downside is you need to create some objects at runtime which can create stutter and garbage. This may vary on a pool by pool basis so you might have some boolean on the create instance that will control whether you want to expand the size of the pool or not and also depends on the game. In some cases it actually won't matter if you don't get a pool object back. Maybe it's for uh, some visual effect that if you have a hundred of them already going you're not going to notice the 101st one missing. So for this demo we will just return null and not worry about it. We hop over to poolable object and here it's very simple. We'll just add a reference, the public object pool parent that automatically gets assigned by the object pool whenever it's creating the pool. So we don't need to worry about it. And whenever we disable, we just want to return this object to the pool. Very simple, very straightforward. Now let's do the bullet. Bullet requires the rigid body 2D component and we'll make it extend the poolable object class. So we'll add the public rigid body here. On awake, we'll grab a reference to that rigid body that we required. On disable, we'll call parent disable, which will add us back to the pool and reset our velocity to zero. Set the speed, let's maybe make it move 200x and 0y, see yeah, how that works. On enable, we'll set the velocity to be the speed. And the last piece before we click play is we need a way to shoot. We'll make the class player shoot. We'll add a public bullet 
bullet prefab that will assign in the inspector public int rate of fire maybe let's have it be five for now and a private object pool bullet pool on awake we will create the instance of the object pool and assign it to bullet pool by providing the bullet prefab and a number like 100 bullets on start we'll start a coroutine to start shooting and we'll call that fire. If you don't know what coroutines are, there's a card on screen that walks through the introduction to coroutines and tells you everything you need to know to get started with them. So we'll create the private I enumerator fire. Wait for seconds. Wait will be one over rate of fire. We'll just put while true. You may want a smarter condition in your game. For this demo, while true is sufficient, so we'll just keep it simple. We'll put a poolable object instance equals bullet pool .get object. We'll check if it's null. That way we don't die if it returns null. And if we get an instance back, we'll set the transform to be a child of player. We'll attach this player shoot to the player object and we'll tell it that the world location does not get retained. And we'll set the local position to be zero, meaning it'll be the center of our player. And then we'll yield return the weight for the next bullet to spawn. We'll hop back over to the Unity editor, attach player shoot to the player object. We'll hook up the bullet prefab reference. We'll click play and see what happens. So great, we see a bunch of bullets spawning, coming out of the middle of our player. If we zoom out some, we see they're kind of going forever and we end up with a lot of active bullets even though they're no longer relevant, they're off screen. And eventually we start getting this error saying, oh, we couldn't get any objects from the bullet pool because maybe it's a configuration issue. We can see here that there's actually, because we used all of them. So let's see how we can address that. What we'll do is create a new class. We'll call it auto destroy poolable object. We'll make it extend the poolable object. We'll create a private const string disable method name. We'll also create a public virtual void disable, which will just set this game object to inactive. We'll create public virtual void on enable. On all of these poolable objects, having on enable and on disable be virtual voids is imperative. This way, any subclasses of them, any concrete implementations of the poolable object, can still inherit this behavior by calling base.on enable or base.on disable and we will invoke the disable method name after the auto destroy time and make it have a auto destroy time property and we'll make it five seconds by default. It's really important that we first cancel invoke of the disable method name. If we don't do that, all objects will after five seconds get disabled. So if you quickly create some objects, all of them will be disabled after that auto destroy time instead of after they were actually created. We'll then open the bullet class and make that extend auto destroy poolable object instead of poolable object. We'll override the enable function so it calls base.onEnable and then sets the speed. If we click play again, we'll see these bullets automatically disappear about 75% across the screen. And if we look at the hierarchy, we can see that the bullets are automatically disabling themselves. And once we have 100 of them spawn, that we start using the same bullets again. Now you've seen how to implement object pooling, but maybe you don't see the benefit of it or you're wondering why does that actually matter? Why would I do this over just destroying and creating objects? I talked about it some in the intro, but let's, let's take a look at the profile to really show why you need to do object pooling. So what I'll do is change a player to shoot 100 bullets a second and the bullets to disappear after one second. If we click play and check out the profiler, we'll see it's working perfectly. We're getting a whole bunch of bullets. It looks like a straight line. And on the hierarchy, we can see them recycling really quickly. And in the profiler, we can see that there's no garbage on any of these frames. So that's that's key. There's no garbage and it executes extremely fast. 0 0.08 milliseconds, 0 0.1 milliseconds, 0 0.09 milliseconds, very quick. I'll quickly go into the player shoot class and make it create new objects and destroy them automatically instead of using the object pool. I'll also update the bullet so it will automatically destroy itself instead of automatically disabling itself. If I could play again on the Unity editor, you can still see that straight line of bullets and you can still see a bunch of objects being created and destroyed very quickly. On this powerful PC, there doesn't seem to be a difference.
we go take a look at the profiler, we'll see that on each frame that fire is called, which is almost every frame, there are 3.3 kilobytes of garbage generated every frame. It also takes 0.35 milliseconds for this coroutine to execute instead of the 0.08 0.09 or 0.1 milliseconds that were there before. That makes it three to four times slower and is generating a bunch of garbage that will cause spikes on weaker PCs, on mobile for sure, and possibly on consoles. I hope you got a lot of value out of this video. I know object pooling is not a sexy topic to talk about, but really it improves your game quality by making it a lot smoother. So I, I hope this helped. I know in my game, Llama Survival, there's at least 30 pools in the game scene. There's so many things that are pooled, and it really makes the game so much smoother. So if you implement this in one of your games as a result of this video, if you have any questions about object pooling, or you have a topic suggestion, let me know in the comments down below, and I'll see you on the next video.